morning. Um, my name is Rebecca Dempsey. I'm going to do the first about hour of this discussion about virtual hearings. The part that I'm doing is going to be a more general discussion and then Paige is going to do some more specific information about Microsoft Teams, which is the video uh, teams approach that the Social Security Administration is going to be using. Feel free to chime in with your experiences and your questions. Um, I have not done a Microsoft Teams hearing in Social Security. I've done them in um, PFA cases, but not in Social Security. So if the, if any of you have experiences, we'd, we would all love to hear them. And of course, I think some of us already have some telephone hearing horror stories, and um, I hope that you will share those along with how you solved the issue. So the general thing that we're, the broad brush thing that we're talking about today uh, is how you can do a virtual hearing and still maintain fairness and due process to the claimants. So you probably remember this from constitutional law classes way back when, um, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment procedural due process clause uh, indicates that we should have notice and a meaningful opportunity to be heard, and that case there that cited Matthews. Uh, so we look at the nature and importance of the private interest at stake. And of course, in Social Security cases, the private interest at stake is significant for our clients because it's whether or not they're going to get Social Security disability benefits or have those benefits cut off. So um, critical to the survival of many of our clients. Um, the risk of erroneous deprivation through the procedures used. So then the question is, does a telephone hearing really give you the due, due process that you need? Um, but on the other hand, if you don't agree to a telephone hearing, how long are you gonna wait for your benefits? And for those many of our clients who are on the risk of being evicted or uh, have other significant income needs, waiting is also a problem. And of course, the, the Social Security Administration, they wanna get done, they're, they're, they've got a backlog. I was on a hearing the other day and the judge said to my client, um, I don't know, it'll be six months. It'll be at least six months until you get a hearing. Maybe it'll be more than that. We just have too many to do. I'm just completely backlogged. I don't know what to do. So, so um, th they're feeling pressure. They're, um, and I think the Social Security is, is trying. I've read some things about how the Social Security people are, I mean, they're understaffed and they have one or two people going in a day to get the faxes and, and they're just, they're, they're missing things, things aren't happening. So we've always had to be diligent in not just assuming that because you sent your 1696 in that it's actually going to mean anything to anybody. Um, so I'm putting way more ticklers in my, than I used to as far as like, I sent my 1696 in and then I called to find out if it was there. And then they said, they don't know, maybe it is, maybe it's not. And then I called again to make sure it was there. And I checked the ERE to see if I could access it. I called them again because they forgot to check the buttons that they were supposed to push the buttons that they're supposed to push um, to make it happen. So uh, diligence is definitely required in this virtual environment that we're all living in. Okay. Interrupt, but I don't think it can be overstated how important that Matthews versus Eldridge opinion was. Um, I would encourage anyone who hasn't read it or if you haven't read it in a while to go back and read it. I, it talks about how social security is a protected interest and that's why we have all these due process protections for it. Um, whether you have the benefit already or are applying for it. Um, it's cited in all types of cases. It was cited in the recent Supreme Court decision that I came out, I think, last week in Carr versus Saul regarding the appointments clause. I think it's also the reason why you can discharge an, a Social Security overpayment in bankruptcy without an offset because you still have a protected property interest in that. Um, so it's a really foundational case and it brings up those really cool constitutional issues that we might miss sometimes representing claimants in the nitty gritty. And it's, I think it's why Social Security is giving us the option to not choose a phone or video hearing um, and not make it mandatory. Thank you, Paige. Well, I thought I fixed the spacing on this. Obviously, it didn't take. Um, telephone hearing downsides. So uh, those of us who had a telephone hearing, and I'd like those of you who had them after I go through these to uh, kind of chime in on, on what you think about this. These are things I talk to my clients about. And as Paige said, the important point 
to start with is you don't have to agree to a telephone hearing. Uh, they will send you a form and you can say, I do not agree to a telephone hearing. And you don't have to write a big long brief about why you don't agree to a telephone hearing. You just have to say, I don't agree to a telephone hearing, which I had two clients do when the pandemic hit. They both had hearings scheduled in March of 2020. They didn't agree to telephone hearings because at the time we thought it wasn't going to last this long. But uh, there are reasons that a telephone hearing is not very good. Um, and I've listed a few. There are, I'm, I'm sure, more than that. Um, so one of the telephone hearing downsides is, is that you can't, the judges can't observe the demeanor of the client. I mean, I, I know that I have won many cases on the judge looking at my client and thinking, wow, she looks really sick. <laughs> she looks really frail. And you're not allowed, and those of you who have done any kind of appellate practice or reading in this, Judges aren't allowed to use a sit and squirm test. They're not allowed to say, oh, she didn't, she didn't seem to be in pain, so I'm going to rule against her. But certainly judges are people and they look at clients and, um, and I've certainly lost cases where I, I remember one in particular where I had a fibromyalgia client and she sort of bounded into the hearing room um, looking very athletic and she, in fact, she was wearing athletic clothing. It really, <laughs> it really, I could tell the look on that judge's face that we lost right then. Um, and then I've other had, had other clients who are doing things that, of course, we always put this on the record if, my, if your client starts to cry or if they seem to be shaking or you, like anything that's happening that's an important to part to, to mention that they stood up or that they, they were, you know, squ that, that they were having difficulty in any way. You always put that on the record. I'll, I'll say things like, um, are you uh, or, or are you crying or or note for the record that the claimant is crying or 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 something to add that to the record but on a telephone hearing i don't even i might not even know they're crying myself all i'll know is i hear dead air so they might be crying they they might you know be unable to articulate an answer to the question whereas on a telephone hearing it's going to seem like they're just being difficult like the judge asked the question and they're not answering it instead of if you saw them in person you could see that they were trying to answer they were trying to remember they were but but you don't have any of those visual clues and of course um what is it the the, the studies have shown that a very large percent of communication is is not just the words that you say that's why um, people with difficulty reading people's expressions have such difficulty communicating because a lot of communication is not just the words that you say. So you lose all that in a telephone hearing. Um, you lose the difficult, the, the um, seeing specific things about, you know, the clients who walk in with a walker or, or those kinds of things. Um, and you also lose the visual clues about how, who's talking when. I had that recently with a, a medical expert cross-examination where the judge was irritated with me because um, I was interrupting the medical expert. But it was hard for me to tell when the medical expert was done talking. Like I thought, I I thought the judge or the the medical expert had stopped talking, but in fact he was just pausing. I mean, he was a he's like, I don't mean to be ageist, but um, he's like eighty six years old, and I would ask him a question, and he and sometimes he just wouldn't respond at all. So then I'd ask another question, and then he would like have have already started to answer the question. Uh, it, it was just difficult. Um, but in person, I would have seen that he was about to answer or that he had stopped talking. I would have had those visual clues about what was happening. So it's just difficult to manage um, a telephone hearing. Does anybody, Paige, or do you, or does anybody else want to talk about other problems with a telephone hearing? I know sometimes. that I've had, oh, go ahead, Susan. Uh, sometimes you can't understand what the person's saying where the person can't hear. And uh, with that lack of communication, you want to make sure um, that everybody's on the same page. Right. I think that that's, that's a, especially if somebody has like a lot, we represent a lot of Hispanic people and, and it's hard enough, to, it's hard to understand what they're saying sometimes uh, because of an accent or because of, of uh, educational difficulties. Paige, did you have? Yeah, I mean, I've had a, I had one kind of nightmare experience. It was my first hearing and we actually brought the client into the office to do the phone hearing with us because she was really limited and she brought her caseworker in. Um, and so her phone was dead. So they just called my phone and I put it on speaker, but that irritated the judge to no end because there was an echo. 
I was in an office that I was unfamiliar with. I wasn't in my home office. And because of COVID, there wasn't anyone there to kind of help me figure out how to use the desk phones. Um, so, I mean, I spent a solid five or eight minutes running around the office, literally, you know, kind of looking like a chicken with my head cut off. Eventually, we decided to just use the caseworker cell phone. So me and the claimant were sitting in the same room with our phones up to our ears, like trying to talk, and we were able to work it out that way, which was a good solution. Um, but I mean, the technology side of things it has been a nightmare, and I'm decent with technology. Um, so that's one of the nightmares. I know I've heard other folks tell me some of their not nightmare stories, but struggles they've overcome. So, and I see some of them on the call. So I'd love to hear anyone else who's had the same kind of problems and what they did to overcome them. I just wanna make note for anyone that does wanna chime in, um, if you go to, you should be able to find the mute button on your menu bar and you can just mute and unmute yourself as you need to. Right, we don't have to, we could use the raise hands function, but that, <laughs> I don't think there's so many of us are going to talk. Well, as we go along, maybe we'll, um, we'll talk some more about, especially like Paige said, I think the technology aspects of it are um, something that is very difficult, can be very difficult. I think I saw some people unmute. Oh, okay. Anybody else have something to say? Okay. Um, so video hearings, now we've all had our, uh, video hearings in the sense that like uh, we go into the whole social security office and the judge is on video. So even that is not as good, um, but at least the judge generally can see everything. They can see you, they can see the client. Um, it's better than a telephone hearing in, in my opinion. Um, but they still aren't necessarily going to see the whole picture of what how the client is behaving. Um, and it also is you're still at a remove. There, there's a study um, that they did relatively recently about what happened when they went from having bail hearings in person to having bail hearings by telephone by video and the bail went up. Um, significantly. No other differences. The difference was they weren't in the same room together. And so um, seemed like the people who were setting bail were less sympathetic to the defendants simply because it, of being on a video hearing. Everything else was the same. So video hearing, you know, is better in some ways, but also downsides. So technology issues. Um, this morning, Jennifer and I had, well, I didn't actually get to participate in the hearing, even though I was supposed to also be joined because um, they forgot to add me. Um, but it was okay because Jennifer did a wonderful job. Um, but that, so Jennifer this morning, Jennifer, maybe you want to tell what happened this morning. Oh, it was, I had prepared to the hill. It was one of my worst nightmares. <laughs> I wanted my record. I had a hearing folder created on our U drive for work. And when I went to access it, cause I'm working remotely today, when I went to access it, it wouldn't work. I couldn't get to anything. So I was prepared to do it from memory if I needed to. Um, you know, I can kind of see some of the pages in my head from the record. Cause I had looked at this record time and time and time again, but that was not fun this morning. So I texted Becky and she has a wonderful husband, in case you don't know who he is. <laughs> <He's> my tech <dead> guy. <laughs> and they sent me the record on Google Drive. Um, in the meantime, the laptop decided it was going to work. This is minutes before the hearing is supposed to start. You know, and I had prepared to the hilt. So that was my escapade this morning. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is, I, I had a telephone hearing where the, the client, um, she lost the connection on her phone. And this is a client who didn't, I mean, all she had was her phone, her phone, she had, she had email on her phone, but that's all she had was her phone. And we were, uh, had, we were in the, I guess it was the medical expert and we were in the medical expert. And then she called me after the hearing and said, 
I couldn't I hear the la I mean I lost my internet connection the phone connection and she didn't hear the last part of the hearing and I didn't even know she didn't hear the last part of the hearing because it wasn't even video for me to be able to see that she wasn't there anymore and because she couldn't use her phone she couldn't text me or do all the like what's the backup you can send me an email okay but my phone doesn't work I can't send you an email I can't I mean what can I do run to the neighbor's house and say send her an email <laughs> so so she missed the last part of the hearing now, I don't think it was critical because it was an expert and, and we, you know, she had testified, but it's her hearing. I mean, just as a matter of due process, you're allowed, you're, you're supposed to be able to participate in your hearing. So um, that, that, that can be a problem. And the, so sometimes, and, that, and that's something you need to talk to about your client is, to, you know, what is your internet connection? And I know that Jennifer and I have had major problems. We have, we use the VPN, which is the virtual private network so that we can, work from home, but go straight, go to the computer that's actually sitting in the office. So that may not for, you know, reasons that are unfathomable to me, sometimes doesn't work. Um, it just stops working and you don't know when it's going to stop working. So, um, you know, maybe the answer is you have a bad VPN and, and so now you're going to have to put everything on your local computer, which has all, which has other issues in terms of confidentiality and putting on Google Drive is nobody's idea of, of a good, you know, that's not what we would want to do, but um, it's, it's, it's difficult when you can't depend on your computer. Um, and it also is difficult when you have clients that don't have enough minutes or enough uh, a, a place to be. Um, then in terms of the technology as far as being able to hear i mean there's being able to understand a client but there's also sometimes the um they, like they speak softly or they turn away from the phone like i you know i turn away from the phone when i'm looking at a piece of paper so when i turn away from the phone my voice may turn away from the, now i'm using a headphone so that doesn't happen but um but if i turn away from the phone and pick up a file and i'm looking at the file and my voice isn't headed towards the the computer anymore and that's what I'm using then you can't hear what I'm saying so that's a problem um, you need to tell the client to put their own name on the box here so it, it, and not uh, so that they're not displaying their brother sister cousin's name um, and attorneys need to remember to do that too because early in the pandemic that was more of an issue then there's the issue of does your client even have a cell phone that works I mean I I had a client who right right before the hearing I mean it, again days before the hearing her phone her phone stopped working and then she said oh don't worry I'm gonna go get the I'm gonna go get it fixed and then it's gonna be fixed and I'm gonna call you she and then I never heard from her and then the next day she said she got a phone but it was a different number and then the next day it's like oh I have the, I'll have the old number so use the old number and I'm constantly saying that Social Security Administration here's the new number no wait don't use that number here's this other number no okay wait no way okay finally it is this number um and i actually called them the day i called them um i think it was the day before the hearing or the morning of the hearing to say okay i know i've switched a lot this is just to confirm this is what it is but then the other issue is a lot of times i don't know what everybody else's experience is i can't get oho on the phone anymore um i don't know if other people have i mean i try to have i have special particular people whose phone numbers i know um, but sometimes I can't get to the person I need to talk to about the technology issue that I've got. Yeah, we're having a terrible time in some, I mean, we used to have a hard time in Wilkes-Barre, but now we're usually able to get someone on the phone there, certainly if we have an extension. I know our service area covers Elkins Park, and that can be difficult. Um, it's hard to track down the 1696s. I mean, who, the question of who do I call? Am I calling the field office? Am I calling OHO? Am I supposed to be calling tech support with ERE? It's hard to get answers to those questions sometimes, and you spend a lot of time on the phone. Right. It's dramatically increased the amount of time it takes to do nothing substantive whatsoever about your case. This is not I'm writing a trial memo or, or brief. This is I'm trying to get 16, the 1696 recognized so I can download the ERE. And um, and the numbers change. I mean, I used to have numbers that worked and then you don't they, they work this time. They don't work the next time. And it's um, it's difficult. And then, like I said, some a lot of our clients are going to have issues with minutes and data and then you have to talk through whether you're going to do like page did and say okay come to my office that's what we're, that's the solution is we'll come to the office but then of course the office has to work um so telephone hearing rules in um in general yeah and i think Paige is going to go over this more specifically but nobody else is allowed to be in the room um 
this is when I've reviewed this with clients has been a problem for them because a lot of our clients lived in crowded living search situations. A lot of my clients don't have a room that's not somebody else's room. <laughs> so you have to talk through with them. Okay, so you need to be alone. Um, so can you ask the other people to get out of the bedroom during this this time period and talk to them in advance about that so that they understand it so that they're not you're not having the situation I've had sometimes of kids being, you know, the kids come into the room and then and, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, mom and, and two kids at home, that's what it is. And there's there's nobody to watch the kids and uh, especially in a pandemic. So it's 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 difficult to set that up. But that's what it's supposed to be. Nobody else in the room and no recordings of the hearings. And I will add to that, no, um, you, with a telephone hearing or any virtual hearing, um, you want to be careful not to give the client so much information that they're tempted to read from it. I've had clients do that sometimes. Like you write, you write your wonderful trial brief and then you send them a copy. And then at the hearing, they're inclined to repeat word for word or almost memorize what you said in the trial brief, which is not what you want from them. You want, you want their testimony. You don't want them to repeat word for word what the doctor said in using doctor language. It's always, it's not, I mean, I always tell my clients that this is your opportunity to tell in your own words how you feel, what, you know, what your pain is, what your symptoms are. You don't have to give me a diagnosis. That's the doctor's job. You just need, you, what you need to do is, is explain how it affects you. So you have to be careful, it, it, like if you're sending an email, so what's going to happen is this, and I want you to testify to that. And then the, if, you, if it seems like the client is reading something, that's a real problem. I've had clients actually, telephone hearings, in I've done welfare telephone hearings in the past where I had trouble with clients. Um, they wanted to lean over my shoulder and look at my hearing questions and answers so that they could, you know, so that they could read them. So that, you know, hearing prep. Have you had ALJs kind of telling the client not to be reading things? I've had maybe 50% doing a little spiel about that, like you shouldn't be reading from paper and the others I haven't heard anything from. I haven't heard that every time I have heard that. Yeah. But even if they don't say it, you don't want the client to be tempted to do it. You don't, you don't want to send a uh, something that's so detailed that they're going to, and of course the clients get nervous. If you've ever testified as a witness, I've testified as a, as an expert witness. It's no fun. It's much more fun being the attorney because then you have control. You have to ask questions. It's, it's hard to remember things and the clients, you know, they have impairments, they're disabled. That's why we're representing them. So a lot of times the, the bill, their ability to communicate, I mean, they just freeze sometimes, but you have to reassure them that freezing is a, like, we can remind them of things that they, they don't, you know, don't do an outline that you're going to read from. Okay, um, the technology requirements. So um, for a telephone hearing, you need a working phone and you need to make sure that the phone number that you have and that the Social Security Administration has is the same, is the phone number. Um, and our clients, you know, as I said, often change phone numbers or lose minutes or, um, and also the ability to mute that's I the one hearing I had the judge was very irritated because somebody hadn't muted and she was when I say very irritated I mean somebody hasn't muted yet please mute your phone <laughs> that and and uh, you know you think you know how to mute and I admit I had a hearing once and I thought I know how to mute the phone and then the judge starts yelling about it and I'm like what where I'm <laughs> you know so so practice you know being able to mute there's a, you know different ways to mute everything then Microsoft Teams um, and you're going to need a, some, again, some device, a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, something with a camera and a microphone and speakers, um, and make sure that the camera, microphone, and speakers work, and that the camera is not covered up. You don't pull the thing over so it doesn't work, and you need an application and a high-speed internet connection and practice before to make sure all of these things work. So before the video hearing, and these are general suggestions. Um, I saw su these suggestions when I originally did this training last summer from the disciplinary board because they'd spent a lot of time trying to, to figure out how to do video hearings. Um, so one of the things they suggested was to close things on your computer so that you're not um, you're not getting notices, that you're not getting things that pop up. 
uh, if you're sitting in front of your computer, you don't even know your your brain is like, I'm not going to read my email, but if email pops up and you see it, you, you your attention can di- get diverted, even if it doesn't make a noise. And of course, you don't want anything that's going to make a noise during the hearing while you're unmuted and talking. You want to um, test the audio and video in advance for both you and the client. You want to sit at a light source, facing a light source. Um, with no window behind. I would say no window behind is the is a pretty important thing because if you have a window behind, it'll just, it can just wash you out altogether so that you can't really be seen, or the, the client can't really be seen. It should be, page is, page is a good example of how, <laughs> of how you should look <laughs> in uh, when you're doing a hearing. I am not a very good example because I only have mostly my head, just a little bit of my shoulders. You're supposed to be, um, your head and shoulders are visible on screen. You can prop, prop up your, your device so you look, so it's taller, so they're not seeing. And you certainly don't want to lay your cell phone on the, on the um, desk, so it's just, point, you know, you don't want to have it coming up from behind you. So it might be a matter of like you're holding yourself or you're propping your cell phone up on something so that you're getting your face, not not the view from underneath your face. Um, so join in advance so to make sure you can join because that 15 minutes can be the 15 minutes the page ran around her office <laughs> and like, no, this doesn't work. Okay, I'll plug this in, I, you know. <laughs> and just because it worked yesterday doesn't mean it's going to work today has been my experience. Everything could be perfect yesterday. And then the day of the hearing, something like Jennifer this morning, something happens um, that it doesn't work anymore. Or somebody, you know, did something like your tech people decided to update and your whole thing that you thought you knew, you don't know anymore. So during the hearing, if you wouldn't do it in a courtroom, don't do it in a remote conference hearing. Um, so in turn, you dress appropriately. Um, you know, if it's a hearing and you're going to be in a video hearing, I would wear like, like I'm walking into a courtroom. I would not. And I would also wear appropriate. There's, you know, on the Internet, there's a ton of example of people who don't wear appropriate pants. You might need to stand up. <laughs> keep, keep that in mind. The client might have an issue next door that you need to go and turn on her mic or do, you know, you might need to walk away from the camera for some reason. So make sure you're appropriately dressed the whole way down so that you can stand up and do something. Um, if you want to or need to, to fix something. You want to wear, um, uh, besides what you wear, you want to make sure that you're not, I've seen people do this, you know, I, doing a Zoom hearing in a vehicle, it just is not, you know, it, I don't care whether you have mute on or not, having the, in the car, it can be distracting and birds flying around and kids playing and that kind of stuff, you don't want that. And again, you talk to your clients about that because they, um, they may have issues with, again, kids, dogs, um, places to be. I had one client who, for some reason, when she called me, I think she did this for privacy because she lived in a crowded living situation, but she would always call me from the bus station. Um, and, and so the bus station, I guess she felt like it was more private at the bus station, but it was almost impossible for me to hear her. She would, but she'd do it a lot. Um, where, and then you'd hear the bus station noises in the background. So talk through that with the client. Better to be overheard by a stranger than by someone you know, I guess. Yes, I think that is what it is, especially if there's an issue, because these are, these are um, difficult things. I mean, sometimes you're asking about substance abuse and the real answer is an answer you don't want mom to know or, mm -hmm. you know, husband, brother, sister. So yeah, she, she, would, um, she would do that. I already talked about not uh, muting when you're not talking. Um, and we, I tell my clients that I will call them after, you know, I talk to them, I'll call them after the hearing and talk to them about what happened. Normally that would be the thing in an in-person hearing. You'd walk out and you'd say how it went and what's going to happen next. And, and of course the clients always want to have that conversation. They want to hear how it went. They want to know, did they do okay? And normally they want to be reassured that they did okay. Um, and it's rare that I'll tell a client that they did it, even if that is the, the case. It's rare that I will tell a client that <laughs> you really... <laughs> <laughs> that answer was really um, not helpful. And, you know, of course, you try to prep them before the hearing with if the judge says you could do that job, right, it'll be a really simple job where you just sit at a desk and, and let and greet people as they came in, you'd be able to do that, right? No, I would not be able to do that. Um, but if they said if they answered that, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I think I could do that. It, you know, it is what it is. 
Okay. Um, so there's a form. I think Paige is going to share the form. Yeah, I will. Um, that you that you can do um, for the remote telephone or online video hearing, um, and and if this is a quote from SSA.gov, it's not mandatory. The telephone hearing option is not mandatory. Video hearing option also not mandatory. So for the client, it's a matter of talking through the the disadvantages of waiting versus the advantages of of going forward. Um, you know the disadvantages of of the of the way the hearing is going to be and make sure they understand this is their one hearing. A lot of clients think if they appeal, they'll get another hearing. And so it's important to tell them, um, you know, but it's important that they know that they're not going to have a hearing because they usually, uh, most of my clients, they don't know that. So um, these are some things you might want to think about when you're talking to your clients about why you would not want to have a telephone hearing in a particular case, apart from the issue of of um, of speed and and the other general considerations. If you have a client who has difficulty hearing, then a telephone hearing is not going to work for them. I mean, a lot of people, especially older clients, they're going to have difficulty. They they have difficulty hearing. That's not if they're in person, they can understand because a lot of them will use lip reading as a kind of as an adjunct to their difficulty hearing. But if they don't have that, then then that's going to be a problem. And so, and you know from talking to them how well you can communicate with them. So that's a particular reason why you might want to um, consider not having a video hearing. Then vision impairments. Um, again, for a, for a uh, video hearing, that, that can be a problem for them um, not being able to, like they might not respond in the way the judge is going to expect them to respond. Uh, you need an interpreter or a sign language. Now you can request an interpreter. I'd be interested in the experiences of the rest of you. I requested an interpreter for a witness and basically I didn't get it. I sent a letter. I said, I want the interpreter because my client, it's her grandmother who cares for her and I'd like to have an interpreter. And I said it in advance. I called about it and it's, it still didn't happen. Now, I think that's an appeal reason if we, and the client wanted to go ahead with the hearing anyway and the grandma was you know she kind of understood English and kind of didn't and but but it was a decision that normally is the kind of thing you'd say can I have a five can I have a break while I talk to the client about whether or not they want to proceed with the hearing even though you don't have an interpreter today but without but because there's no there was no ability for me to get off you know get off the telephone and talk to them confidentially that I, I couldn't have that conversation in the way that I normally would have been able to to come so that decision was on the, that that discussion was on the record like what I said to my client what the ALJ said to the client um, was on the record so so I you know try to ask for that in advance um, and nail it down if you can get through to them Speech impediments, I, a lot of clients have speech impediments that may make it difficult. So then you might have people with mental health issues, um, both the auditory and visual hallucinations. I've, I've represented a fair number of clients with those kind of issues, which is going to be a lot harder um, on a telephone. Um, you know that when a, when a psychiatrist says that the person seems to responding seems to be responding to internal stimuli, in other words, they're having, <laughs> they're hearing voices, they're seeing things. Um, if you have a client like that, doing a telephone or video hearing is going to be particularly challenging. Seizure disorders. Some people, a, a, a computer screen that flickers, computer screens flicker all the time. And some people with seizure disorders, the flickering of a, of a computer screen, or for that matter, overhead lights, overhead um, fluorescent lights can trigger a seizure. So you want to make sure that you ask a client if that's going to be an issue. Of course, I have some clients who don't want to be recorded <laughs> because the government is evil and they don't want to, you know, so that's that's an issue too. Oops. Um, then uh, the intellectual disabilities in general that could make using technology of any kind difficult, even telephone making sure you've all had clients where you, you, you even making a simple phone call is is sometimes challenging and then of course you can say okay it's no problem you download the app and it'll be all good and you just do this and that and the other thing a lot of people it doesn't matter how much you tell them that it's not going to happen so those are the people you have to talk through they're going to have to come to the office or we're going to have to do it for them and it's like put it in their hand and then walk away from them 
because it's not going to happen any other way. Okay, so the agency. Becky, I, yes. Sorry, if I could just interrupt. This is Kelly. I'm going to launch the first of the CLE question poll boxes. If you just hit yes or no um, in the question box, it will disappear off your screen and that will be open for about two minutes. Attorneys, you must respond to both questions in order to get credits. And Becky, please feel free to continue. Thank you. Becky, I don't, did you want to pause at all and, and see what were some other reasons that folks had for declining? Yes. Uh, or on the flip side, because I know we've had this conversation like case by case over and over at North Penn. I'd love to hear from it statewide. Or on the flip side, why did you do, a, why did you decide to go with a phone hearing in a given case? Yeah, I think that would be great if people could share their particular yes and no decisions. Susan, I know you said one time that you did the first telephone hearing, maybe it wasn't the first one, that you would never do a telephone hearing again. <laughs> no. So other thoughts? I've, I've had so many phone hearings though. Um, a, a judge that I never had before is a good reason not to have a phone hearing. <laughs> um, they can be so mean when they can't see you and they can be so cruel to the client when they can't see them. Um, just that was my first couple I think I had with the same judge and um, she did get nicer as time went by. Oh, that's interesting. So you think that if they had like a relationship with you beforehand where they'd seen you in person, they're going to be able to like associate a name with the face. Sure. And yep. With you better. Yep. We were just two nameless people on the other end of a telephone and it felt that way. Well, and I think the judges, like the judge that was telling me, it'll be six months. Who knows how long it'll be. They're under significant stress themselves. Their staff are under significant stress and it's probably easy. I mean, it, you know, we, sometimes you pick up well, it, with anybody, like you pick up the phone and you think, this isn't about me. I don't know what this is about, but this person has arrived in a very, you know, a not sympathetic frame of mind. Have any of you had he telephone here? Like, ju just know we're not, we're going to wait till in person made the decision based on factors about what a telephone or a video hearing would be like. Becky, I'll just let you know in the chat box, Claire Grandison said, we usually decline phone hearings in cases with statutory benefit continuation. Yeah, I think that's a good example of, of where you would de uh, decline a telephone hearing because um, they're not going to be hurt. So the balance of the, the client's interest versus the government's interest, the, the government wants to get done, but the, but the client, um, yeah, I think that's a good example. I know one of the reasons I've decided to do hearings has been the finance dire need, like the need of the client at the time. Are they doing okay? Or are they not? The client where I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, it was September, October of 2020, and she had funding for housing through December of 2020. So we were already cutting it close. Um, and she wouldn't have had any funding for housing, was about to be homeless again. She'd had like 12 months of housing. So that's a factor in favor of doing a phone hearing. Um, I have some clients who are like really attractive or look really healthy. Um, so I'm more inclined to do it with them. Um, the strength of the medical record, if the evidence is strong and the testimony isn't as, as necessary because the medical evidence is so strong. Yeah, I think those are good. I actually had the two of the two tel telephone hearings that were or two hearings I had scheduled in March. One was this um, guy who'd spent most of his life in prison, um, but he would uh, he was a, you know, tall built man who was about to have back surgery. But just looking at him, you would think you, you would make it, you know, he did not present well in terms of, also he had a tendency, probably because of all the time he spent in prison, to get very heightened <laughs> when he was in person with like his space. He had very, you know, de definite space needs. And and so it, it, so a telephone hearing for him, I thought was good. Um, the other client was had a difficulty um, because of long-term drug and alcohol use. And so she was very shaky and, and you know, would have present, would have been, somebody that I would think it would be good to have a 
in-person hearing, but we're going with the telephone hearing because she can't wait anymore. She's been without income for so long. I mean, we've had discussions about it and she said, I just can't, I can't keep living on air. Becky, we have a comment in the chat box. <clears throat> I proceed with the hearing due to the extensive medical evidence the client had in her case and felt the judge would be able to quote, see unquote her despite a telephone hearing. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Right. I mean, if you have a medical source statement, you have good objective findings, you, ha you have your trial brief that you think the judge ought to read the brief and just grant the benefits, then, um, and you couple that with a client who may or may not be able to articulate anything, any, you know, with, do any better. That makes sense. But I think it's a case by case thing. And I think the most important thing is that you, that you communicate with your client and make, make this is a joint decision. This is a, this is not a, I mean, the attorneys, you know, the attorneys are in charge of strategy, but I think it's something you want to have a discussion with your client about to make sure that they understand what the pros and cons are and um, that, you know, you kind of reach a joint decision about what, what the approach is going to be, because there aren't good answers as far as, I don't think telephone hearings are in any way the same as an in-person hearing. They're not. I mean, that's, and you could lose because of that. So, um, so that's something that I think people need to understand, but, but still sometimes you just, they can't wait. Okay. Sorry, I think my thing froze for a minute. Okay, so if the hearing is screwed up, you can request an a appeals counsel remand, um, and here's the HALEX provision. If it was an incomplete recording or, or incomplete transcript when you get um, when you get to district court level. So if there's a bunch of inaudibles, there you have the client that turned away when she was talking, and then when it's then when it's transcribed, um, or when you listen to the tape, it's it, you can't hear it. Then that's a reason to say you have to give me a remand because nobody knows what the hearing, what the terrorist testimony was because you there's a thousand inaudibles. And I've gotten a, I've done a, um, quite a few appeals counsel successful appeals counsel challenges based just on that that you can't you can't review it. How do you know what she said? So so the witness prep list. Um, so you do a technology check and do it intentionally do it don't just say to the client so you have enough minutes and you have you know you have a good connection <laughs> and, and you know how to use mute right now i mean get your phone <laughs> get on your phone let's practice you 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 hit the mute jennifer and i did that the other just this week with their recently with this client she had this morning hit the mute okay now unhit the mute okay we know how to use mute you should probably do that for yourself too hit the mute <laughs> okay that works now now unhit mute okay good um if you're going to use a laptop, make sure it's in charge. Make sure that Microsoft Team is is installed, and that your tech people didn't uninstall it when they did a you know when they did an update, um, which has happened to me. I thought I had an application, and no, that application is no longer there. Um, so practice using the controls. Make sure that the video and audio work, and then the camera works. Um, explain to the client how to put their name in the box, and then establish a backup number or plan. So this is the hardest part, I would say, because the clients don't, you know, for you and I, it's like, okay, well, I have my cell phone and I have my Zoom phone. And if that's, you know, it, so, and I have the OHO's number, which you may or may not be able to get through to, but, um, you, you know, you have, like, you have a bunch of numbers. You have, you have, like Jennifer texted me this morning. So we have, you know, we're like, we, as a professionals, we have multiple ways to communicate with each other. But a client may have a phone and that's it. And the phone might not, and the phone itself might not be that reliable. So figuring out what to do about that. And might be interested if other people have suggestions on a client with a, with a somewhat good phone um, who tells you, I can't come into the office because I'm afraid of COVID. Ideas? So what I've done, and I'm sure the rest of you have probably had ideas too, um, is I usually talk to brother, sister, cousin, mother. Like, do you have a mother with a phone? Do you have a brother with a phone? How about your boyfriend? Does he have a phone? So um, in, in the same way that you would do for like a P PFA hearing, like you'd talk to people about the, like, who saw you right after he beat you up? So, but who's, who's there? And that who's, who's, who else do you know that can, 
give you a that can let you use a backup phone can you but in COVID this is a lot more difficult than it used to be the run over to the neighbor and use their phone system which used to work reasonably well before COVID now the neighbor is not going to be you know unless everybody's fully vaccinated and I'm going to be less thrilled about that option um and then there of course there's come to your office um but but again you have to talk through that if your phone doesn't work what are you going to do because if your phone doesn't work and the social security can't reach you now if you're there they're not going to be able to dismiss the hearing outright if you're if you show up you just say my client's not here they're supposed to be here i don't know what happened i'm asking for a continuance if you can't grant the record you know if you can't grant it based on what's um in the file and i think if they refuse to get that you probably got an appeal issue but um thinking through with your client specifically what we're going to do to fix this. So let her show if it's a video like show me what you're going to like let's practice you you pull up your Microsoft Teams and I'll pull up my Microsoft Teams and you can see my picture of my parents uh, farm and let me see what's in the background <laughs> of your uh, in your background. So I've had I've had clients lose I, not social security hearings but um, other hearings based on what they had on their t-shirts. Um, people sometimes forget that the words that they have on their t-shirts can be offensive to people. Um, so you don't want to have a poster in the background that's going to be offensive to somebody um, or embarrassing to the client. You know, you did like the, just and it is embarrassing to the client to, to sometimes to, for people to be looking into their home to see like, I'm not a rich person. I'm a poor person. See this stove that's falling apart. See this big, enormous hole in the wall. That's how I live because that's because I'm poor. Um, and then you can talk to the client about, you know, maybe changes that could be made. Um, the camera angle I talked about, make sure you look at the camera during the hearing. Don't like, here's the camera and I'm, you know, I'm looking out the window. Um, talk to the clients about how to dress. I always do that for any kind of hearing. It's also true for a telephone hearing. Um, even though you're not going to see that much, you, you still, you know, you don't want, um, you know, you don't, they don't need to dress up but you want to talk to them about dressing appropriately and then um, how they're going to manage to be alone and then practice. I, you know, in the old days, Susan remembers, when the old days when you had a hearing it was in person and you just brought your file and you had in your file, you had your hearing, you know, you had your social security, the, the uh, exhibits, then there were pieces of paper and then your hearing files, your questions and your, um, you know, your medical source statement and so forth. But now that you're on a computer, you're not necessarily going to point print out the 1400 or 2000 page. I mean, I hope you're not doing that. I, you know, wouldn't recommend that um, the record. Uh, so you want the record to be in your file in a hearing folder. You might want to consider um, putting the hearing folder both on the VPN and your local computer if you're going to have trouble connecting to the VPN. I have had multiple occasions where I've had to go through the file and, and look at a specific exhibit. The medical expert uh, case that I was talking to you about, the, the medical expert testified that his testimony was based on exhibit two. So I went to exhibit two. He was talking about physical impairments. Exhibit two was a CE about um, mental impairments. Is when it was a mental CE, and I said, "So you based this on this mental CE?" No, no, it must have been something else. Yeah, I guess it was something else, but I'm not going to help you figure out what it must have been something else. And it was, of course, five years ago. So, but I needed to be able to refer to the specific exhibit. Um, I've certainly had judges say to me. Um, where's that MRI? Or counsel, I'm looking on page 5F6. Uh, right there, she, your client just testified or your client told the doctor that she thought she was ready to go back to work. Or your client told the doctor, or the doctor said, I think this client is, go, is ready to go back to work. Or the doctor, you know, and then, and then I'm supposed to respond to that. So first of all, you want to see it so you can know what it is and respond to it. And you want to be able to give the judge if the judge says, I thought there was an EMG and I can't find it, where is it counsel? You want to be able to point them to it. So you want to be able to have the ERE. Now, you might be able to download, you might be able to connect to it um, on the spot, like just go to the ERE and, and call it up. Um, I, I, and I've done that. Uh, but I don't consider that particularly reliable just because the ERE doesn't always work either in terms of being able to access and, and then say like here's the exhibits. I mean that's something you can do. Um, but I would say you probably got to download it shortly before the hearing. 
in the exhibit files, there's two ways you can download from the ERE. One is um, the exhibit file, which has them in order, 1F through 2F, you know, 3F, whatever. And then there's the all docs. So you can download both of them. But for the hearing, you, you probably want the exhibit file so you can see what's in the exhibits. And then if somebody refers to it, you can refer specifically to that. Um, I, as a backup, and you know, others probably have different strategies for this. I print a hard copy of my hearing questions. So if everything else falls apart, I have my hearing questions with references to exhibits right in it. You know, that, that's, um, if I have a medical source statement that I'm planning to use for cross, the medical source statement that says that they're not even able to do sedentary because of the limitations, I might print that. I might print the MRI or, you know, the very important pieces of evidence. Um, and then I would normally put in the hearing folder my notes on the evidence, just again, so if the judge says, where's that MRI, where's that MRG, uh, EMG, I can search my hearing notes um, and find it and give them the exhibit number. Other suggestions people have for putting what to put in a hearing folder or not to put in a hearing folder? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how you make it searchable. The, You're going to have to teach me that. The notes? My notes? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just find. Yeah, I mean, you, you, it's just you use a word, you type in a word document. So I have one F, you know, and then I just type like the objective findings, reduced yeah. range of motion, MRI shows, you know, severe degenerative disc disorder. And then I go in, in word to the find function, which is like up on the right hand okay, side. Okay, gotcha. Okay, okay. And then it'll, then it'll find it. Okay, all right. Huh. <laughs> So make the entire record searchable. We actually just created a video at North Penn Legal for how to use text recognition. So if you were to download all of the exhibits to PDF, you could go into a P uh, PDF and you could run text recognition or OCR and then everything is searchable. So if you're looking for spondylolisthesis, you can search for that. If you're, if you're searching for BMI, you can search for that. Um, we'd be happy to share that or um, it's just in the tools section and it's called text recognition and we find that to be crucial, especially for like listings or something like that, straight leg raise, SLR, things that are good to search. Right, and I think the, the key there, and I've done that too, I think the key there is whether or not you can different providers use different words to describe <laughs> to describe the same thing so you want to like um you want to search for all the all the possible iterations of of what that is when i take notes i use the same word all the time like i use mri as the as, the, as, as how to do it um and they you know now they're going to say mri but um but yes, I think that's helpful. Although I haven't, the last, I mean, I can't say I think it's 100%, 100% as far as it finds everything, but um, but I have run that. So if you could share that, that would be great. Maybe if you could share that for people. Yeah. And it takes, a, it takes a minute to do. You're not going to wait to, you, know, you don't want to do that text recognition. You don't want to do it at the time of the hearing. You want to do it. It, it, take, <laughs> it takes a while to run that. Yeah. Um, but, or if you're looking for a doctor's name, Right, and that's actually wonderful for brief writing when you want to say, and there are 25 times right mentioned by this one doctor where range of motion was less than 50%, and then then you then you can like pull it up, that doctor, and make sure you've got all those. Or, or I've done briefs um, A1C. The A1C is, has been, you know, over nine for three years, despite all efforts to you know, to bring it down. So she has uncontrolled diabetes. So, so I think that that can be very helpful too. So your notes and the, and the PDF and I think those, those are helpful. Any other thoughts on what to put in the hearing folder? The reason I say put it in a hearing folder rather than in the folder in your computer, I don't know about how your computer folders are organized. I have like, I have a tracking form that's in the main folder, but then I divide it up into um, evidence to be submitted to Social Security, evidence already submitted to Social Security, um, and then the Social Security downloads, because when the files get voluminous, you, like having, a, you know, 25 items on the list, it, I, I like to have divided up into subfolders so I can find things more easily. 
and then as I'm getting evidence, I can, you know, sometimes you get evidence and you don't, a lot of times you get evidence, and you don't have time to really digest it or do anything with it. But I, but I, and I get a lot of it through email, like I get it and I immediately put it in the evidence to submit a folder and then review it and then take out the dupes and then submit it. And then it goes in the, in the file for evidence that's already been submitted along with the receipts from the ERE showing that it was submitted. So when the judge says you never submitted that, I have proof that I did. And then a lot of times at the beginning of the hearing, they'll say, did you, is, is, there, is the record complete? And then you'll say, no, I submitted, you know, it's not exhibited. And that's a good appeal argument too. I submitted evidence. Here's my proof that I submitted evidence and you never even exhibited it, much less mentioned it. That's a good appeals counsel argument. Okay. Um, let's see. So planning for trouble, I, we talked about making sure that OHO has your correct phone number and your client's correct phone number and backup numbers. Um, so I would at least give OHO not only your, I use Zoom phone, but my Zoom phone and my cell phone. So if they can't reach me on my Zoom phone for whatever reason, they can reach me on my cell phone. I know some people have work issued cell phones, but, but um, I, I do that. <coughs> Make sure your client has a way to contact you and OHO if the connection is lost. Um, and a way for them to contact you if they lo lose a connection during the hearing. Um, so you're talking about thunderstorms. I have a thunderstorm story um, doing a hearing and uh, there, uh, actually I think it was a snowstorm. Um, so we were doing a, an unemployment hearing and because of a snowstorm, um, the other attorney lost his connection. Because, I mean, the connection was just, the power lines came down. So no, no um, Fios. So he set up a mobile hotspot. Actually, his wife set up a mobile hotspot so he could get back on. Um, and it didn't take too long. And I, you know, was on the hearing. And, and so the hearing kind of kept going. Um, and I would say that one thing is important to do if something like that happens is don't panic. Because it has happened to other people. The judges are used to this kind of stuff. I mean, just say, just call them and say, I lost my, you know, or, or, or you know, they're, they're, if you come back on, when the other attorney came back on, he just said, I lost my connection. It took me a minute to get it set back up. I'm ready to go, you know, and, and then they'll, they'll, they'll regroup. They'll, I mean, they'll have to regroup. If they don't regroup, then they're denying you a fair hearing. This is a, as long as you put on the record what the problem was, it wasn't like you went to take a coffee break, um, then they have to work with you. So, and tell your client the same thing, don't panic. I mean, do everything you can, but don't panic. All right, so in conclusion, we're gonna analyze whether telephone or online video hearing is a good idea using the factors that, um, that we talked about and any other factors that are specific to the case. Um, if necessary, you don't agree to the, with, to the telephone hearing. Um, you explain the impact to the client. You talk about the likelihood of success as your current case is. Some cases would benefit from a further delay. <laughs> Some cases are better if like, she, you know, right now, it's, it's as good as it's going to get. Let's go. Um, so, you know, you think about those things. You talk about the consider tech issues in advance, develop a plan and develop a backup plan. And Paige is going to talk more specifically about Microsoft Teams. And I'm going to get, I will... Stop sharing. Okay. So, yep. Hi, everybody. So, I'm going to steal Susan's line because Susan's always great at encouraging people to show their faces. So, if you'd want to share your camera for just a minute to wave and say hi, I think that'd be really cool if you're willing to do that. Oh, I see some. Like Susan says, it's it, we, we miss the in person face to face. Oh, we've got two seasons. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I assumed you weren't all bots because I recognize your names, but you never know. Okay. So I'm going to talk about teams to some extent. I have not done a teams hearing yet. I have started doing teams hearings workup basically up to the point of getting a notice from Social Security and what to do there. Um, at the end, I'm going to be asking anyone who has had a hearing to share your thoughts, or as I'm speaking, if you could throw it 
in the chat. And Kelly, maybe if there's a chat discussing an experience with the team's hearing, we would just save that for the end. Um, but just if you can't unmute, feel free to throw it in the chat or and feel free to jump in and interrupt. You can unmute yourself at any time. We're all still learning. I just know we wanted to do a little bit about Teams before we all started doing them regularly. My understanding is that in June or July, um, once we've started doing Teams, we'll have a part of one of these sessions to be interactive again and talk about our collective experiences with them. But first, we've got to get to the Teams hearing. Um, so I'm Paige Martineau. I'm from North Penn Legal Services. My email is on here. It's pmartineau at northpenlegal.org, and you'll get a copy of this PowerPoint sent around. Okay, so I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. Um, first, the first place to start is actually Social Security's website because they have a really good website for this virtual hearing stuff, um, and they have a video that's available that I've been playing for our clients, so I thought I would just play it now that kind of talks about how Social Security is going to do teams. So hopefully this will work. I tried it. Hi, I'm Deputy Chief Administrative Law Judge Christopher Dillon from Social Security's Office of Hearings Operations. I'm here to introduce you to a new, flexible, and secure option to attend a hearing with us called online video hearings. Since March 2020, we've been offering telephone hearings to the public. An online video hearing is another safe and secure option to attend your Social Security hearing and a part of our continued effort at Social Security to reach you where you are during the COVID-19 pandemic. Internet-based video collaboration services like Zoom, WebEx, or Google Meet have become quite popular as safe and secure options during the pandemic. In fact, Many public and private organizations are already using these types of platforms to conduct business professionally in a secure environment. Online video hearings with SSA will be very similar using a free online platform called Microsoft or MS Teams. During the hearing, you'll see yourself, the judge, and your representative if you have one on the screen. The judge will conduct the online video hearing in the same manner as in-person and telephone hearings. Other participants, such as a vocational expert, medical expert, or interpreter, may join the online video hearing by phone only. The judge will ask you and any other witness to take an oath or affirm that your testimony is true. You will have a chance to testify and tell the judge about your case or ask any questions you may have. Likewise, the judge may ask you and other witnesses questions to help make a decision in your case. Technical support will be readily available to help with any technical issues that come up during the online video hearing. So if you are interested in this new and exciting hearing option, here's what you'll need to participate in an online video hearing with Social Security. Access to email, because we will be emailing you the link and instructions for your online video hearing. A camera-enabled device that can download and install the MS Teams application and has a camera, microphone, and speakers, such as a personal laptop, an Android or Apple tablet, or smartphone. The device you choose must be connected to a secure high-speed or Wi-Fi data connection and you'll need a quiet, private place where you can participate in the hearing uninterrupted. We are working to expand the availability of online video hearings across the country. Once it is available, you'll receive an official notice or phone call from us. You'll have the option of choosing this new hearing method or a telephone hearing that we will continue to offer while our offices are closed to the public. To get more details about hearing options with Social Security during the COVID pandemic, you can visit our website at www.ssa dot gov slash appeals slash hearing underscore options dot html. I hope this information has been helpful and we look forward to serving you through this new innovative hearing option. Social Security, securing today and tomorrow, reduced at U.S. taxpayer expense. Not just going to play that over and over. So it's a little propaganda y, but I mean, it's a nice video to send to clients. I think they like to see what it's going to look like and be able to imagine the judge there. It emphasizes that there's going to be some blank spaces. So the vocational expert is only going to be by phone. I think everyone but the claimant, representative, and judge would be by phone. I think a medical expert would be as well. But I'll show you later how I send a link to this video and this website to the clients when I actually invite them to our Teams meeting. So just this is just a screenshot of the overall um, 
website that Social Security has. So again, from the Social Security website, some frequently asked questions. Um, I wanted to just copy and paste some of them into the PowerPoint since you'll be getting it. Uh, so it's all in one place for you, but we don't need to read every word and Becky's already talked about some of them. What are online video hearings? I think we've kind of seen what those are. Why should I use an online video hearing? The main uh, justification that they give is time. They state throughout their website, we cannot provide an estimate of how long our offices will remain closed. And that probably doesn't surprise anyone on the call. What equipment do I need? They've spoken about this a little bit. Um, access to email, computer, laptop, or smartphone. Um, you don't necessarily need the application. I mentioned that I think in the next slide and then a quiet space. So we've been over all that. Um, is there an app that I need to download for online video hearings? It depends. If they're using a laptop, um, a computer with Google Chrome or Microsoft Edge, you would just join through your, the browser. So you would click through the email link and you can do it through the browser um, or you could download the Microsoft Teams application on a computer. It seems like on a mobile device, you would need to download the application. I tried to test this earlier on my phone to see if I could do it with the browser because I have a browser on my smartphone, but I also have the Teams application. So it just automatically went to the Teams application. Um, it, I don't spend too much time talking to clients about how to download the application because when they click on the link in their email from a smartphone, they're supposed to be prompted with basically the correct program and it just says download now. So we haven't had anyone so far have a problem with, with actually getting the application. Um, there will be a pop-up that may try to get you to create a Microsoft account. So do I need a Microsoft account to participate in an online video hearing with SSA? No, um, but it might be kind of hard to explain to the client how to get around the pop-up. Um, you have to close the app, go back to the link in your email and try it again, and then to join without a Microsoft account. I haven't been able to test that either. I guess I could have logged out of my account. Um, it may be easier to just have someone set up a Microsoft account, but if they're resistant, they don't have to. You just have to kind of click around to get around the pop-up. Am I required to have my hearing by online video? We talked about that already. No, but you'll be waiting for a while. They seem to imply and they have no estimate of when they'll be um, back up again. Just as an FYI, last March, I inherited a case that was ready to be scheduled back then and the client insists on an in-person hearing so we've been waiting at least 13 months yeah and it looks like we're going to be waiting at least another six at least i think i don't think social security has is going to move quickly but at least those cases will be kind of at the front of the line I mean, people who are just getting denied reconsideration now are going to be behind so many people that once they start scheduling, they're going to be still scheduling people who were initially scheduled in March. You had some, I had some, Becky's mentioned some. Um, so it's gonna be a serious backlog. And at least with videos, we wanna take another look at all of our cases to see if we can get our clients cases moving, um, You know, if it's something that would work for them. Um, you can have witnesses participate, uh, but you would contact the hearing office to get that set up. You don't need a username or password. Um, and Social Security will send an email reminder a few days prior to your scheduled online video hearing. And I've got an example of the email that you get when it was first scheduled a little bit later. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit already. This is just what Social Security recommends. What should I do to prepare? Um, practice with the device. Social Security has this option that you can click to from the PowerPoint if you're, do, if you're using it online, which is an online video hearing lobby. 
to test the device. So this is basically a 24 seven lobby that you can try going into that is exactly the same as your actual hearing lobby will be. Um, that is not where I send my clients first. Instead, I set up my clients with a Teams meeting with me and we go through all of it and then we'll send them either to the video hearing lobby if they haven't received a notice yet or we'll just send them to enter the lobby that's in their notice. But the online video hearing lobby is one way to test um, if, they, if they've got themselves set up correctly. But as you can see, when you get your email, you can click here to join your online video hearing at any time. I just tested it for one that's set for July. Um, I think that's probably the best way to test if you're good is going into the actual lobby that will exist for your hearing. So, and on the day of your online video hearing, um, charged, connected to the internet, quiet, private, click the link and that's just about it. Uh, there, they made sure to put in the frequently asked questions, I am in the lobby, when will I be admitted into my hearing? Um, you will be admitted from the lobby when the ALJ is ready to begin. Please wait patiently, do not hang up, someone will admit you shortly. I'm sure we've all been in the actual lobby of a hearing office in person and had to wait. I, it seems like they're anticipating that the same thing will be occurring over the teams and just important to warn your client that just because it's scheduled to start at a certain time, it might not necessarily, um, you, you're going to have to be there just like you'd have to be in the lobby. You shouldn't be doing other things. You should you really shouldn't be doing other work, you know, bring a book or something, talk to your client about the case. Um, but, you know, you'll have to wait in the lobby. Can I type messages during my online video hearing? You can type messages. SSA employees do not have the functionality to respond to messages, which I think is interesting. But more importantly, if you type and share messages, they're viewable by all participants. Um, so if for some reason you can't, your client can't get off mute or you can't get off mute, there is a chat function so you can communicate in some way. Um, if, if that's the issue that you're having, but there's some limits to it. And we need to make sure our clients know that they're, even if they try to do a private message just to us, it would be viewable by everybody. Social security has some examples, which is what we would practice with the client. How do I mute my microphone? You touch the microphone icon on the screen and it's muted when the line is across it. How do I turn on and off my video feed? Same thing, video icon, when there's a line through it, it's off. When there's no line through it, it's on. Um, you hang up by hitting the red hang up icon. And so here, for things like this, they're telling us contact your hearing office for help about this. So this is, you, you're not calling the field office for tech questions about OHO. You might need to call the field office if you sent them your 1696 or if you sent them evidence that hasn't gotten transferred up to OHO. But if you have problems with the team's hearing process, you would contact your hearing office. And we talked earlier about how that is and is not always possible, but you would just want to document your efforts in doing so. Okay, so that was it for the frequently asked questions. So like I said, rather than doing an online video lobby, we have just started inviting all of our clients to a Teams meeting, whether they have a hearing scheduled or not. Um, so if they've been denied reconsideration or they're coming to us already at the hearing level, we just go ahead and set up a Teams meeting. This is the Teams interface. Um, and I thought about going on to Teams to do this, but I was worried about confidentiality. So I used screenshots instead, but it's pretty user-friendly. Um, you don't have to go to the specific date. Like, let's say I wanna make an appointment for May 1st. May 1st isn't on the calendar, that's fine. You just hit the calendar button and whatever shows up, you can go and hit new meeting and that's how you schedule. For people who are in your organization, you can just type in their name. For people who are not in your organization, like your clients, 
you have to type in their email address. And after you're done typing, you wait a second. And then this invite icon comes up and you have to hit the invite icon or it won't send it to that email address. So I usually do that first. Then you can fill in all the rest of your information. We usually just label it teams meeting and then client name. And so then I can see I've got my coworkers, Mary and Carol, and then this would be the client's email. You fill in the date and time. I, you can set it to be a recurring event if you would need that, if you wanna meet with the same client every other Friday at one o'clock. Um, I've not used the channel or the location functions um, for any purposes so far and social security has not given any indication that we need to know about them. Um, so I leave those blank. You can leave the notes blank, but this is where I put in um, information about uh, the social security hearing website that we were talking about. So I know this is gonna get sent to the client in an email. So in addition to them getting an email with the link to our Teams meeting, it gives them a link to the social security website that has that video that can give them some more information if they're feeling anxious. And then you just hit send. After you do that, you'll end up with an email um, that'll look something like this, depending on what you use for emails. Um, it will have whatever the title of the calendar event was will be the subject line of the email. Like anything else, you can accept it or decline it. And then you find the link to click here to join the meeting. You'll get another email when the client accepts it. So this team meeting was accepted by the client. And again, you have a link to click here to join the meeting. That link seems to be in basically every email that gets sent from the team's application. And so again, you see that the title along with the date and time are on the subject line. Paige, I'm sorry, if I could just interrupt. This is Kelly. I'm going to launch the second of the CLE poll boxes. I will leave it up for two minutes. Thanks. Please continue. So that is that is just working with the client. So we learn how to do teams. We, I've asked my staff to review the information on the Social Security website. I send the client information about the website and I set up a team's appointment with them. Next, we start interfacing with the hearing office. So I'll just pause real quick to see. I don't see any more in the chat, but does anyone have any questions about anything up to this point? Okay, feel free to interrupt me if you do and you couldn't get your mute button off in time. Um, so next you need to interact with the hearing office. So there is a new form that is getting sent out that the hearing office seems to refer to colloquially as a COVID form. Um, and they, according to the social security website, and this seems consistent with what I'm seeing in our cases, the COVID form is sent 30 days after OHO sends confirmation of receipt of the request for hearing. So they're not really waiting for a hearing to be scheduled. That being said, uh, pretty much everyone who requests a hearing seems to be getting a phone hearing scheduled almost immediately because they have open hearing spots right now. So it's happening really quickly. They have two different forms, but they're basically exactly the same. This is one for claimants without an appointed representative. You'd fill in the claimant's name, social security number, the wage earner social security number if you're claiming off of someone else's earning records. And this is for unrepresented parties, but it still leaves a space for a representative's name. There's a notice. Um, and it, it again says that we will postpone your hearing until we re reopen our offices. Um, there are two boxes. You should complete both of them. The first one is for telephone hearings. If you do not agree to a telephone hearing, you just hit do not agree. If you agree to a telephone hearing, you also have to provide your phone number. And then you have to make sure that you also complete the second box, um, whether you do or do not agree to an online video hearing. 
And if you agree to an online video hearing, you put your email address and your cell phone number in in case there's a problem with the email. It provides space for con uh, comments, and then this would be where the claimant would sign and date. The one for representatives is exactly the same. It just has an extra signature box down at the bottom. Oh, this must be both of them. So this one just has a place for your representative signature and date. And you're certifying that you represent the claimant, you've consulted with the claimant, and the selection on the form accurately represents the determinations. So if you want to wait for an in-person hearing, no matter what, because you want statutory benefits continuation or your client's not in treatment and they need more treatment or whatever the reason is, you have to say, I do not agree to a telephone hearing and I do not agree to an online video hearing. Um, these forms will be sent around with the materials, I believe. Some things of note, the representative can sign in lieu of the claimant. You don't have to go get your client's signature. Um, you can sign for them, um, but it is sent to both the claimant and representative. So we have had clients who get it a few days before us, it comes with, you know, some kind of letter that says, please return this to us within X number of days. So they panic. Maybe the mailing date is much different than when they actually received it. So they only have a few days. So they'll consent to something that we didn't want them to consent to. So far, we've had no problem reaching back out to the hearing office in those circumstances and just resubmitting the form or submitting a letter explaining that the claimant had not spoken with us yet and um, we've explained to them more about their rights and it's in their best interest to wait. Um, we used to just do the continuance requests with a letter, but we're finding that we're getting people calling from the hearing office and saying, can you fill out the COVID form? Social Security loves their forms, so that's what we've been doing. So you'd fill out and submit the COVID form. And then this is as far as I've gotten. So when you actually get scheduled for a video hearing, this is what your email will look like. It'll come from OHO. This, says, this means region two, because that's what Syracuse is. It gives you the date, gives you the time. I can't, it gives you the judge. I can't see anywhere that it's telling me the claimant just from this notice. And I haven't received a hearing notice for any of our claimants for July 16th, 2021. I'm sure that's a confidentiality issue. Um, so you kind of just have to play the game of match the, you know, match this to the client. Um, I suspect I know which case it might be, but we don't know yet. Hopefully we'll get a hearing notice in. Our office is going to have to figure out exactly what to do about it. But as you can see, it is personalized. Oops. It gives you that hearing office's phone number. You should not respond to the email. Um, it, it provides more notices that it had already, you know, that we've talked about already. Um, and down here, it just says click here to join the meeting. So this is what I've been testing. I can click this now and go into the lobby that will be the same lobby for my hearing on July 16th, 2021. And I know that it works. So when I figure out which client this is, I'm going to have them log in to this exact lobby. And so that's what it looks like when it comes. And from what I understand, we'll get another reminder that looks just like this a couple of days before the hearing. And this is just what the rest of that email looks like. Um, it provides more information. It looks like they didn't finish filling in the template because here it says add appropriate contact information, but we do have that earlier in the email. Interesting note is this about privacy. It points out that Teams is a non-governmental application controlled by a third party and Social Security's internet privacy policy does not apply to this third party. Um, you should use a private internet connection, but it does say that if you are uncomfortable and no longer want to, you know, as a result of this privacy notice, you can basically withdraw your consent to a video hearing. So that is as far as I've gotten on Microsoft Teams um, so I, we're, we're kind of running out of time, um, but we do have a few minutes for questions. So my first one is, has anyone done a Teams hearing? Uh, 
Um, I have, but not for Social Security. It was for um, EFAs, and I I thought it was very helpful. I enjoyed Teams as opposed to the phone. Okay. Were there any technical problems or glitches? Um, you know, I did a number of hearings this past year by Teams, and I don't remember any technical glitches at all. It was pretty smooth. That's fantastic. Um, certainly Social Security will have its own problems, but maybe they took so long to set this up because they really wanted to iron the kinks out of the system. I really <laughs> doubt that. <laughs> so it Let's, sounds like maybe we haven't had any teams in our region yet. My Which first is, one is July 1st, and I have yet to get the notice that you received. So I wonder, is that 75 days? Seems like that's less than 75 days. Mm -hmm. I might be really wrong on my math, but I think it is. So I wonder if, um, so maybe you want to contact the hearing office, see if the claimant received the notice. Um, I still don't know which claimant this is. This was my first one. I was glad I got it before doing this training. But again, we're going to do a follow up. You know, we wanted to introduce how to get the client set up, how to test it, where to go for information, how to interact with OHO. But I'm sure this is going to be an ongoing statewide conversation um, as we start doing the team's hearings and we start talking about the pros and cons and what's different about these video hearings versus our Court of Common Pleas video hearings. But I know we've all been dealing with this for a while. Um, so did anyone, so it sounds like we haven't had anyone do any Teams hearings yet. I look forward to talking about that later in the summer. Did anyone else have any questions or comments? From me or Becky. I am not hearing any, and I think we've hit our time target. I think as long as we're within 15 minutes, we're good, and we're definitely within that. Becky, did you have anything else? No, I appreciate everybody participating, and we'll be looking forward to hearing your stories of, of how it all goes, and then the appeals that we all do saying we were denied due process <laughs> and by virtue of all these uh, procedures. So, so thank you for participating, and feel free to reach out to us um, individually with, with other questions that you may have. And Paige and Becky, thank you so much for being with us today, sharing the information with us. And um, Becky, hope you're feeling better. And everybody take care and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining okay. us. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye -bye.